All right, welcome to another episode of the Wild Strength Podcast, where we talk about all things wild and all things strength, and really everything in between. Today, my guest is Charity Wanacek, and her walk-up song is Just a Girl by No Doubt. So we're going to play a little snippet of that to get things going. This is such a classic. It is. My first album I ever bought. Really? Yes. I kind of forgot about this song, and when you said that's what you wanted, I was very happy. Oh. I might honestly have that. Like, you know, on Spotify, you can choose a playlist from the song that might be my workout playlist later. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Like, that Tragic Kingdom uh, album was so good. So I bought that one and um, Wallflowers were my first two albums I ever bought. And it was in sixth grade and they had, like, just come out. Nice. CDs were kind of a newer thing. Yes, I'm dating myself. I'm old. Mm-hmm. I know. But anyway. Uh- some of the songs I still listen to, yeah, from like middle school or my childhood, they're ageless. They never get old. I don't oh. care what anybody says. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we have Charity Wanacek here. I will let her introduce herself. Um, we've talked a little bit. I've actually never met Charity. Um, hopefully one day that we do. Uh, but I followed her on Instagram for a little bit now. She's doing some really cool stuff. She works as, I actually was listening to another short podcast you were on, and it is a goldsmith. No, not a goldsmith, a metal smith. Yes. Goldsmith, yeah. Metalsmith is like a bigger term that would like encompass any kind of career path that, that would be working in, yeah, metal, especially like hand. Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah. So Goldsmith with a business that she has started herself, Ghost Town Metalworks. Uh, but yeah, I'll let her introduce herself, tell as much as you want, and then we'll kind of get into it. All right. Sounds good. Um, well, thanks for having me on, first of all. And I was trying to pick my brain. Were you at TAC in Utah, by chance? I was, but I don't think we ended up crossing paths. I feel like we might have crossed paths if we didn't know each other at all and didn't, like, know each other's names or anything. But I'm pretty sure I met you at the Rocky Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation tent, possibly. I don't know why I feel that Ah. way. Don't know. Anyways, I think it's possible. (laughs) Um. So my name is Charity Wanachek, and yeah, I'm a, a metalsmith. I'm a goldsmith more specifically, so that means that I make jewelry out of precious metals, uh, mainly gold and silver. And I've been doing that for about seven years now, but I was uh, heavy into vet med before that. So that's what I did for my career path before I transitioned to having an at-home studio to actually just be home to to raise kids and just, and just be home and be present. But... Um, Yeah, I'm a huge art nerd, but I'm also a really big science and nature nerd, too. So I kind of have all of those things that that work together. So, um, yep. And uh, my business is uh, mostly custom work. So I uh, really enjoy getting to work with people. I am surprisingly introverted. Probably wouldn't know that from social media, but it's different when you're talking to a phone instead of a person. (laughs) I know it sounds really dumb. But, um, yeah. So, and I like you said, I'm an adult onset hunter. Um, I've always been obsessed with nature since I was a little kid, but I did not grow up really in a hunting family. Um, I remember my dad got like one turkey when I was a kid and like one deer, but I didn't go on the hunts or like it. I don't know. I have no idea. So like he was not really heavy into that. It's more like he has friends that did it. So he'd like just go do that kind of stuff every now and then. But I ended up marrying a hunter um, who's been hunting his whole life. And so that's how I ended up getting introduced to this whole field And, um, I, yeah, helped Aaron on his hunts for, you know, almost 12 years now. And then last year is finally like, okay, it's time for me to be the one putting in for tags. Well, yeah. And, um, the reason is that, um, just tags are getting so darn hard to draw. And we were up in Washington state for a long time. And then we just moved back to Nevada to my home state like two years ago. And, um, Aaron's just had a heck of a time, uh, getting tags and, uh, we're just like, dude, we got to get some meat in our freezer. Right. And so like a lot of people had the wake up during the pandemic too, like the food crisis. Right. So I just told Aaron, I said, all right, time. Like I just got to suck it up (laughs) and put my mind to it. And I like challenges and I'm always out there with him regardless, you know, and being vet med, like, you know, blood and surgery stuff, all that stuff doesn't bother me. Um, there are other aspects that I will have to work through mentally for a long time, probably. But um, now I'm excited for it. And yeah, last year was my first year. Officially, I took my um, Hunter's Ed like almost yes. exactly a year ago. I think it was in, I'm pretty sure I finished my Hunter's Ed 
in January. Yeah. So like a year ago, like just happened. So nice. very new adventure for me. <laughs> yeah. That's exciting. It's cool though, that you, like you said, you've gone with him for all this time. So you're very familiar with it. And now you just finally have your own tag in your pocket. And so you get to tag out too, which that's exciting. But I want to start. Yeah. You, we've actually kind of talked about this a little bit before you were in vet med. Um, what kind of, what, first drew you to vet med? I know you said you've always been very into nature. Was it that part of it, like animals and nature that drew you to vet med? Um, and then talk a little bit about, yeah, your transition to art and being a goldsmith because two totally different careers. <laughs> you know, what's funny is that I keep running into jewelry and art people that were vet med or human med. It's the craziest thing. <laughs> it's so strange, but I keep, I find more and more of them all the time. It's really amazing to me. But um, yeah, yeah, so I've always been into art since I was a little kid too, but um, I grew up in rural Nevada, down a dirt road, had lots of, like, it's an agricultural valley that I grew up in, so lots of open fields and just cool places to go explore. Um, my best friend, who's still my best friend now and actually lives here, she's the reason we moved here, we would go, nice. you know, down to the yeah. river together or the creek or, you know, whatever. So we were always messing around outside. I've always liked rocks. But as far as vet med goes, I've just always been obsessed with nature, especially living sciences have really always held my attention. So I was one of those kids that had like my bedroom plastered with like pictures of tigers and <laughs> Jeff Corwin. Yeah. <laughs> yes, nice. <laughs> so um, yeah, I just, I when I was little, I just was like, yeah, I'd like to be a veterinarian. And I wanted to do wildlife or exotic medicine. Like that was the stuff that really held my attention. So. That was what I worked towards, um, kept my grades up and everything, and then found a private school because um, I went to a really small school. And like I mentioned, like I'm actually a little bit introverted. So going to like a big university was extremely mm -hmm. scary to me. So I found a little school in Spokane, actually, that had just started a pre-vet track. So that's where I went and got my uh, bachelor's in biology. And then I minored in biochemistry and art there. And that's actually where I got my exposure to jewelry was at that college as well, because I was taking mm. art classes to kind of balance out all the rigorous science and math classes that we had to take. But um, yeah, I, I worked at animal hospitals. As soon as I graduated high school, I got my first job as a kennel cleaner and you just kind of work your way up and um, was an assistant for a lot of years. And then I decided I took my tests and everything to go to vet school, but they wanted large animal or research vets at the time. And that was not what I was wanting Not and they an really only mm -hmm. vet school so hard to get into. It's very competitive. Uh, if you think about it, there's a, probably about as many people that want to go into vet med as human medicine, but there's a fraction of the schools available. Mm -hmm. So that makes the competition to get into vet school actually very demanding. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's very hard to get in in the first place, but um, yeah, I, I just was like, you know, maybe I'm going to sit on this for like a year and see what, the industry is shaking out to and with it being like 300 grand to go to vet school it's kind of a serious <laughs> thing to think about you know and so i thought on it yeah it's so expensive and so i um and that was shoot that was back in like 2008 so i can't even imagine what it might be now so, oh, yeah crazy yeah. i sat on it for a year and stayed in vet med and decided to get my veterinary technician's license up in washington and then i stayed in that for quite a few years and um loved it very much loved it but i did small animal um i did a little bit of a, a guest spot in spoke or outside of seattle at a um well a progressive animal wellness society they have a wildlife rehabilitation center so i got to go volunteer there for a while and i absolutely loved that so much except you have to wear like goggles when you're hand feeding grebes so they don't stab your eyes out so there's like some fun little <laughs> things like that we were like oh <laughs> Use glasses yeah. and you're like, why? And they're like, they just stab at anything that's shiny. And you're like, oh, oh. <laughs> but yeah, no, so I did that. That's what I'm working with. <laughs> yeah, but I loved it. It was exciting. So honestly, like that's my real thing. Wildlife is is a huge, huge passion of mine. Um, but fast forward all those years, met Aaron, moved to a little town called Cleelum, which is in the foothills of the Cascades. Aaron was born and raised there, grew up walking from his house to go fly fish the creek as like a seven-year-old because his uncle in Montana taught him when he was like really little. And so Aaron's been doing all that right. stuff for a long time. It's like deeply ingrained in him. And he's, he's a very quiet guy. He is a man of few words and he just, he loves to be outside. 
And I just, I never mm. met anyone else that enjoyed, that seemed to enjoy the out, the outdoors as much to a depth as I did, even though we had different experiences in the outdoors, right? But like, I just, I didn't know anything about it. People had to teach me in college how to even go hiking and what base layers were. And I just, I didn't have anyone in my life <laughs> that did that. So, and being up in the Pacific Northwest, like you got to be dressed appropriately, right? So um, that was kind of my whole transition into like literally being like invested in the outdoors is, is knowledge. And I was craving it. I really was looking for people. I was constantly looking for people. If they, does anyone cross my paths and they seem cool and they, they like knew how to hike. I'm like, Oh, can you, you know, can you take me with you? I, I want to learn, you know, the right ways, like how to backpack and things like that. So hunting is like that for me too. And I'm lucky that I'm married to someone mm -hmm. that, that knows so much and has been so immersed in it. Um, but it's been so nice to try to find other adults that are adult onset because it seems like most people I've encountered in my life that are into hunting, they were raised in it. It's just like family tradition and mm -hmm. like every, they know everything about it and this whole area and stuff. And so um, it's been really encouraging. And I only know a small handful before the, prior to the last like year and a half or two years, very small fraction of women I knew that hunted. Like I didn't ever have yeah. access really to women that hunt. Fish, yeah, fly fish, no. I didn't know any women that fly mm -hmm. fish like before like two years ago. It's just, it's so strange yeah. how, how it's, it's like that. But, um, Instagram, like social media has totally like opened up that whole world. And my, <laughs> that's been like the most positive thing. My business is mostly online. So like, that's why I'm, I was initially so invested in Instagram. Um, but I made like a secondary mm -hmm. account. It's not even flagged as business. Cause they get really weird and persnickety about posts when you're a business. So I have it as like a I mm -hmm. mean, fitness account or something weird. But, um, you know, I initially made those for business, but it's like the connections and the networking there is where I stay. It's true that I need it for business, but the connections there are just, I feel like it, it's priceless. And there's so many really kind, super knowledgeable, very welcoming people that I just keep encountering. So it helps <laughs> a lot. Yeah, but, yeah no, I would say the same. And, I, and I've said... I've said, I think on like multiple podcast episodes now, how much I hate Instagram, but also how much I love it because of the connections that I've made and the people that I've met. And, and same, I'm, I'm also an adult onset hunter. Uh, my dad and grandpa actually were hunters. Um, they were rifle hunters, um, but they both passed when I was really young. And so I never kind of got the opportunity to go out and do that with them. But I know like even after then we had so much venison in the freezer that even after they had passed, we still had that meat to, to live off of for a little bit anyways. Um, so I was very familiar with that way of life, just never kind of got the opportunity to do it myself. Um, the one thing that I did do is as I grew up fishing a lot, we would go out and just sit on the lake. We'd reel in some catfish and then fry them up. And that's what we had for dinner. And so fishing was really my first exposure to fishing, hunting and, and the outdoors and, and being in Texas, is like very different than being in Washington and Nevada. There's no mm -hmm. hiking. There's nothing that's really outdoors. And I grew up like kind of outside of the Dallas area. So definitely nothing outdoorsy, but I was always so drawn to it. Anytime we traveled, we went to beaches, we went to mountain areas, all of these things. And so the first second I got to leave Texas, I was out of there. <laughs> I did not want to be there anymore. And I came to Colorado and I love Colorado. I love all of the Mountain West area, um, but Colorado is just where I happen to be right now. But very, yeah, very similar. And then I came out, I hunted for a year in Texas, um, but I knew what I wanted to do with hunting because I do enjoy the mountains and the outdoors so much that the style of hunting in Texas was just not what I was looking for. And, and I still, I'm still technically a Texas resident. So I'll probably go back every year until I'm not, it's a cheap tag to get. Yeah. Um, and it's honestly, it's, it's a, yeah, a cheap tag and it's an, an easy harvest. If you know the right people, you're guaranteed to get at least a doe. Like I went back to Texas twice this year and I got a doe each time. Okay. Um, and so, and I'm so new that I'll shoot the first thing that walks in front of me. <laughs> I'm not waiting for a big buck. I'm not picky with what I'm harvesting. Um, but yeah, so that I just knew that wasn't quite the style of hunting that I was interested in. And, and I wanted to come out here and learn more of like the Western style hunting, the backcountry style hunting. And obviously that's totally different, you know, in, in Texas, like I said, you're almost, you're not guaranteed. Nothing's guaranteed. Um, but you I feel like have a higher likelihood of a success, especially because a lot of the hunting out there is hunting on a feeder. Um, so you kind of, at least if you sit there for enough days in a row, something's going to come by. Whereas yeah. I could sit the same spot in the mountains for 10 days 
and not see anything, right? You, you've got to be moving around. You've got to be finding the animals versus just waiting for them. So that's mm-hmm. been, yeah, super cool experience and, and like learning experience for me. And then women, yeah, I think when I first got into it, I would go, I tell this story often. I don't know if I've told it on the podcast yet, but my very first hunt was with this older gentleman who I believe I met through the bow shop that I was going to. Um, and he had owned a property. It was a free range property. And I, I would go out there with him just whenever he didn't have clients. Cause he was like, you know, I love teaching kids and obviously you're not a kid, but like you're new and I love teaching nonetheless. So like come out here just whenever we both have the time and, and we'll see what we can do. Okay. Um, and I like had just this older man. And I remember telling like a friend that I was going to go hunt with this man. And she was like, Whitney, that's scary. Like share your location <laughs> with me. Like yeah, yeah. Share where you're going. She's like, there's weapons involved. Like you'll have a knife. He'll probably have a knife. Like you never know what's going to happen. But I knew like that was what I had to do to put myself out there. I didn't know women who were doing this and, and I would have loved to learn from a woman. I would have loved to go out there and, and all that. And I'm not like picky either way, but I just, like I said, I knew what I had to do and that was what I had to do to put myself out there and to learn. Um, and then now really through Instagram, like I've not met anyone Eh, maybe at a couple like tack events I, I've met some women who hunt in person but I think most of the the women that I know I know through Instagram and I think that's that's the beauty of of all of that is just the connection that you get from it and, and similar I'm no one would believe I'm also an introvert <laughs> I like once I'm socializing all day and like talking to people all day when I, I want to come home and I don't want to say a word I've got to recharge I've got to refill my battery because I have just completely exhausted my social battery when I'm talking to people <laughs> yeah. all day so yes. yeah that's I think and you probably relate to this and the like being an introvert like social media is kind of an easy end <laughs> to talking to people okay. and to socializing yep. and sometimes it goes beyond that um but yeah i i think that's that's awesome um the work that you do with the jewelry and the ghost town metalworks and all of that i've seen on some posts like you've taken um maybe it's a tooth or something from like an animal that someone has harvested correct and you've maybe even turned that into jewelry um i think that's such a cool way to really tie the two together but i also have noticed a lot of the jewelry that you create is more geared i would say geared towards the outdoors not necessarily that people are wearing jewelry in the outdoors but there is a specific type of like fashion i feel like that people are looking for and that is what you create has the outdoors really influenced what you feel like you create in your work hmm well as far as the elk ivories go that's only something that i've started doing in like the last year Um, I had a friend, um, send me her ivories. My, I have to say like, when you're starting a business off, it's amazing when you see who shows up to like help your business Mm. get off the ground. Right. Like my friend and family is like, they're, they're top notch, right? Like they're always, they're always so good to be supportive. And even seven years into this, you know, they're still at it. So like this one gal, which I'm, I'm actually still working on her set now because I wanted to put some extra thought into it, but um, my friend Megan, she sent me her ivories like maybe four years ago. And it was when she was still living in uh, the area that we're in now in northeastern Nevada. And she had gotten she'd gotten her first full elk tag and she filled it. And so she wanted me to set the ivories. And me being vet med, like we veterinarians and vet techs do everything. You know, in like human medicine, you're always like sending people off to specialists for everything. I've always worked at clinics where like everything is totally inclusive. We might occasionally send off stuff for confirmation, like labs or like histopaths or something like that. But even then we do tons of labs in house, do a lot of, uh, you know, cytology in house, whatever. So that being said, like I've had to do a lot of dental work. So like messing with teeth doesn't scare me. I've had to help dig roots out and all kinds of nasty stuff, you know? So like dealing with ivories wasn't, wasn't um, too intimidating. It wasn't enough to a point where I was worried about cutting the tooth and wanting to make sure that I was doing it in a way that wouldn't ruin it. Because being vet med, I knew you can overheat a tooth and kill it while it's still in the mouth. So you have to be super careful with what you're up to. And so I didn't want to like cook the ivory essentially by trying to like cut through it and they can change the color and the texture and kind of turn chalky and weird. And so um, luckily there's a gal who happens to be like pretty much a stone's throw from here for me that's been doing ivories for a long time in jewelry and she cut them for me. And uh, that was like kind of like cool. the into that. It was about a year ago that she did that for me and it was so generous. She wouldn't even let me 
um, pay her for it. So I have to give her a shout out because she and I have totally different styles too with our jewelry. So people, when they're looking for jewelry, like I'm a custom artist, but I really like to make stuff like in my style. So if people get a hold of me and they have like kind of a particular style, that's not really my thing. I'll try to refer them to another. I have a pretty good network, you know, of friends uh, that I can refer people to. So I'll try to like refer them to someone that maybe can can help with that style a little better. So Kim and I have different sty styles, but uh, she's KHD. So uh, Kim Hunter Designs is her her um, oh, cool. business name. So I wanted to throw it out there. Uh, she's been setting ivories for like thirty years. So she's the one that told me how to cut them and I'm so grateful. And I've since kind of adjusted my method a little bit um, from what she taught me since I could get bearings on what I needed to do. But yeah, so I started doing that, but elk ivory jewelry has been around for a long time. Um, humans have been putting ivories into jewelry for an extremely long time. It's actually something that they have done over in Europe for a long time too. Um, so the stags there, they, um, in the UK, I mean, yeah, there's a gal there that, that started kind of bringing, bringing that kind of jewelry back from the dead. Essentially, no one had been doing ivory jewelry there for a long time. And, and the um, stags that they have there, the deer that they have there do have ivories. Um, so it's pretty interesting once you start looking into it. It's also a very, very big thing with like traditional German jewelry is to have elk ivory rings. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's been around for a long time. So that I like old stuff. I like antiques a lot. So that aspect of it to know that this is like an old school thing is really fun. But yeah, I would say as far as like nature um, influencing my jewelry, sometimes um, I'm obviously grew up in rural Nevada. So like there's a little, that, a little bit of that like Southwest flair too. And then I, I focus on regional mm -hmm. stones that are around me, at least for what I stock in inventory. If a client gets a hold of me and they really have like a specific request, um, you know, I can go source something for them if it's out of an area. Like I had someone ask for Herkimer diamonds before. Those are from New York um some things like that mm. but um yeah i mostly keep things here and it's fascinating because there's so much amazing interesting rock and mineral uh in any area that you're in like if you're in colorado i bet if you went and picked up a gem trails of colorado book because like falcon guides also makes those they don't just do wilderness guides they also do um geological guides too um you'd be uh floor at like probably what is around you and trails you could go hiking on and the kinds of uh, crystals you could find or whatever so that aspect of it yeah because my business model like originally and i'm still working towards this i want to be able to find the stone cut the stone and then set the mm. stone to the story like i want to be able to do all of it so rock counting is something i'm super yeah. into. and so that is part of my business model so as far as that that's why i always say like when i'm setting stuff i tell people like the area that that stone came from and it I try to buy mine direct or buy from the rock cutter that got it straight from the mine or the rock hound. Um, so traceability is super important to me too. And um, I love the environment. I want to take care of it. And that was the most uh, amazing thing for me to learn is that that Aaron taught me is that hunting is conservation. Like I was so ignorant about that for so long. I had no idea because I mean, you should have, he was like throwing up in his mouth when we first started dating. So I pull out my checkbook and it's like a, World Wildlife Fund checkbook. And he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> he's like, they, he's like, <laughs> yeah. all, they, all they do is line their pockets with money. They're not doing anything for conservation. And like, I got this whole like lesson about it. Right. And at first I'm like, all right. I'm like, all right. So he's got one weird quirk. We'll let it all go. Right, for now. <laughs> but eventually, I mean, over the years, like That's Aaron okay. was able to like show me enough evidence, like, Hey, look, how much this foundation is like donated to conservation towards a specific species and all this. And going, wow okay like i can get on board with this so like i really do care about the environment a lot um i try to not be wasteful i sometimes almost to a fault borderline hoard maybe like plastic bags and <laughs> people to reuse them i don't know but like uh, i try to be really aware of that so that also ties in with my business model is because you have to look at you know we hear carbon footprint and stuff thrown around a lot and now the last couple of years Mm -hmm. The WEF, we all kind of get negative connotations with some of those words, but it's like, it's yeah. true. I mean, it's yeah. good to think about. I'm not, and um, yeah. I've said this before, um, you know, to people is that I'm not knocking, you know, jewelers that are, that do choose to set, you know, Moonstone that was like dug in Russia or whatever. The problem I have with it is that the person that mined it probably did not get paid fair wages at all probably horrible conditions. The people that mm -hmm. cut it in the factory, probably horrible conditions. And again, not fair 
fair wages. And then think about how far that stone had to get to come all the way over to the U.S. for someone to set it into a ring and you bought it for like five bucks or whatever ridiculously cheap price that you got on that Labradorite. So like, that's my other thing is that yeah. um, I buy super quality stuff. I know where it came from. And there's a price tag that goes with it, but it's also putting food on the tables for people here from the families of the of the miners or the rock hounds or the cutters that like are doing it because they want to and they're getting paid a fair wage and and all that money is staying here. Mm -hmm. So like I just really try to encourage people to look at what's close to them and buy try to buy stuff that's like regional. So like people in Russia buy stuff that's regional. People in Australia try to buy stuff that's regional. Yeah. You know, it's like it's everywhere. So it's not like um some people I think get mad at Americans to think we're like poo pooing the rest of the world who were like American made only. And it's like, no, just try to support your economy. <laughs> like the country that you're in is really what yeah. it is, right? Yeah, I hear some folks who say the same thing. It's like, oh, like you can, you're such a conservative for only getting American made things. And while that might be a very conservative mindset, I guess, like forget politics, right? Like I'm just supporting locally i'm supporting yeah even bigger than supporting the economy is supporting people who are local who are starting their own business like when you have someone who's around the corner who's making what you make what you want who maybe it's a little bit more expensive than than what you want to pay for but how cool is that that it was made around the corner versus yeah you paid maybe three maybe half of what it was to get it shipped from another country and it was made in a factory or whatever like i i have and i have a really good friend who's an artist and she started as a painter and then has since kind of transitioned into like sculpting and stuff like that and i don't have an artistic bone in my body like my ability to create art is non-existent and, and i hear some artists will say maybe you've just never explored it or you've never tried and correct i have never explored it and never tried so, <laughs> so maybe i do and i just haven't tried um, because I, I do try, like I tried making, um, candles for a long time out of like old whiskey and wine bottles. And that was really fun, but like very limited art was needed for that. <laughs> um, I was just cutting glass basically and pouring scented wax into it. Um, but yeah, I have such an appreciation for it and for buying from local artists and all of those things. And essentially, even though you're making jewelry, it's still an art process. Um, I think it's super cool. Like you said, that you're, you try to use like local rocks, um, and stones and all of that. I've always been so big into stones and rocks and all of that. And funny enough, when I was in my undergrad, um, I actually started out as a political science major, um, and then like was pre-law, thought I wanted to go to law school, uh, and quickly decided that was not what I wanted to do. That was not the route that I wanted to go. So I switched to pre-major is what my university called it. Um, and I just took a bunch of random classes. And one of the classes I took was um, environmental science, which that kind of uh, led me to the whole like conservation aspect and like shed a light on all of that. Um, and then I took... Um, Oh, shoot. In that environmental science class, we spent like two weeks talking of just about rocks. And I was so interested in that specific part of the class. And I almost ended up, uh, we had the major, um, forgive me, what is the science of rocks called? I'm forgetting. Um, ge geology. There's um, geology. Yes, yes. So we had the geology major there. And I was like, what if I majored in geology? Like, how cool would that be? But then when I thought about it long term, and I didn't put too much thought into it. So you can you can read me for this one. But uh, I was like, what do I do? With, what the hell would I do with a geology major? Like, that sounds so cool. And rocks are so interesting. But I didn't know like what to do with it. Um, since then, you know, I, I've met people i have come across people who were geology majors and have these super cool jobs. And I'm like, man, I wish I just would have went with like a true and, and not like I ended up majoring in exercise science, still a very large interest of mine and something I'm very passionate about. But like, man, I always wonder, like, what if I would have went with that initial like I would have either done like environmental science or geology and like how much different would life be if, if that's what I would have chosen? It's it's pretty interesting. And like, um, especially when you look at like the mining industry. So they employ a lot of geologists, obviously, because they're, um, they're needed for a lot of things. But um, yeah, the conservation and environmental sciences are super interesting. Like uh, for one of my courses that I had to take, we had to take conservation biology. So we had to simulate mm -hmm. 
population growth and, um, you know, pretend like a really, you know, dangerous, deadly disease wiped through and to kind of see how it affected the, the growth of populations, how many years it took it to recover. And all of that stuff is super interesting and really gets you thinking about impact for sure. And Washington State's really big on hydroelectric dams and um, wind powered electricity. And so those conversations started too. I actually got to go to one of the dams and um, after 9-11, you have to get like background checks to even be able to go, mm. to go in. Um, but I mean, it's very fascinating, but there's also detrimental effects to it. It's the cheapest, most efficient way for us to make energy, but it is true that it's affecting salmon populations and stuff like that. But what do you do? You're gonna take the dam out, then how else are you gonna make power that'll be able to, I mean, they sell that power all the way down to California. So it's like, you have to, it's wow. like nothing, nothing is ever a perfect solution. And that's what I keep telling people. Um, and that's like an interesting side of my personality is I really like dissecting stuff and, and researching it and figuring it out. And the fact is, is that there is no mm -hmm. perfect solution. Electric cars are not a perfect solution. It's like absolutely horrible mining practices to obtain the metals that go into those batteries and then they're not recyclable and they're super dangerous. So it's like a, not a sustainable thing. And then you had California uh -huh. had to like shut off the power grids because too many people were charging their vehicles and the grid couldn't handle it. Well, most of California's power is coming from Nevada. Like they're ripping out lots of habitat here to put in solar panels like that in itself is, is gonna be heating the earth, just having solar panels and not having vegetation there. And then you're taking out vegetation to be turning CO2 that would be turning CO2 into oxygen. So it's like, there's no perfect mm. solution to anything, right? But um, yeah. it, it, even studying rocks, I think is important because uh, they can look at what the earth has been through over the years by studying the, the sediment layers and all that, it's pretty, pretty fascinating what they can tell history wise what's gone on. But um, I know that was kind of a random tangent, but it's just, it's just the conservation aspect is that okay. nothing is perfect. There's no perfect solution and there's no way mm -hmm. that they can look in the future and foresee this other possible complication, you know, that they hadn't taken into account. Just like people bringing invasive species in to try to control another species. And then that mm -hmm. one ends up running a, you know, native, species extinct or borderline extinct or you know it's like there's all these unforeseen circumstances the conservation scientists uh, sciences are extremely interesting to me because um you have to look at things from a lot of different angles and um i wish people would mm. would do that i think people would be a lot less opinionated yeah. 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 like that you i like that you kind of you're like yeah i went off on a tangent but like a great tangent right like i think that is such a huge and important conversation to have and for people to recognize that and even say you have a conservation first mindset with, with kind of anything that you're looking at even then you're not always 100 percent correct or maybe like there is some point of view that you're missing and like you said there's no there's no perfect answer there's no perfect solution and i think that's just what everyone wants for everything everyone wants a solution everyone wants an answer everyone wants to know how can we solve x problem with y and that's that's not always the case like sometimes we just have to live with the consequences of our actions um, and then sometimes there are solutions but it is like a very multifaceted approach to the solution there's not one way to do anything kind of like you said um, yeah, I think like you mentioned the science of rocks and like how much you can learn from the history and the sediments and all of that. Like once I started realizing I can hold a rock in my hand and there's so much, or stone, whatever. And there's so much that can be told from that one, which some people might be like, oh, that's an ugly rock. Like it has dirt on it or whatever. But I'm like, do you see like there's layers in the sediments and it's probably been here for X amount of years and it's probably been, or it's been weathered down and all of these things. And people just look at me like I'm crazy. crazy. But this uh, one, yeah, I've always just had this. <laughs> This yeah. kind of salt can only happen I've because always... the lava was ever whatever temperature, and that's why there's bubbles in it instead of being more <laughs> homogenous. And they're just like tuning out. They're closing. Yeah, <laughs> they're, yeah they're like, oh, okay, she's crazy. <laughs> she likes rocks. <laughs> um, no, that's so funny, and I love that. Um, yeah, I think I and maybe I even messaged you about this like earlier in the year. Um, I am set on harvesting a bear. So when I first came to Colorado, I didn't know anything about the draw. I didn't know anything about how you got tags in, in the West. Like in Texas, you just go to Walmart, you get whatever tag, you get your tags for the year and it's like 10 bucks and that's it. So I move out here and it had like, I had, they luckily they have a secondary draw here. So I had missed the primary draw. And I, for some reason, 
Oh, no, no, I, not for some reason. I know why. I was more set on a bear than a deer or an elk or anything like that. And when people are like, what do you, why a bear? Like, you've, like, would you eat the bear? I'm like, yes, if I'm harvesting something, I'm eating it. I'm going to use as most of the animal as I could. Um, but for me, like, I, I didn't know anyone at the time when I moved out here who hunted or who would be able to help me. So in my mind, I guess if I got a 400 pound bear, I'd be screwed, <laughs> but I didn't know the likelihood of coming across a 400 pound bear. In my mind, if I'm hunting alone and I'm packing out alone, a bear just made sense. Um, and I had also heard stories of a lot of people would find, and, and like the places that I was looking, like the bears were not too far off, like not too deep into the back country. Um, so I was like, okay, I, I don't even really have to go too deep in for where I'm looking. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, my initial plan was I, I'm doing this alone. And, and unfortunately in the time that I was, I've been here, I've met so many people and I ended up not having to do that hunt alone. Um, but I also ended up not filling my tag. <laughs> I did see a very large 400 pound cinnamon bear that I just completely blew my opportunity because I had been sitting the same wallow, actually waiting for elk. Um, and very rookie mistake here. I had been in that position for like probably four or five hours at this point. Um, hadn't seen anything, hadn't heard anything. So I'm just lazy. I'm sitting back, like my bow is not in my hand. I don't have an arrow knocked, whatever. And sure enough, like you don't, you would, I would think that I would hear a 400 pound bear coming, but I didn't hear a sound. And that's why they're good at surviving. <laughs> um, is he comes in and I have to pick up my bow. I have to knock an arrow. And in the process of doing all of that, he sees me and he spooks. And I'm like, oh, had I just been ready? <laughs> had I just been ready? Um, but anyways, to tie it back to what I was starting with, that was, that was why I was choosing a bear tag, but I still am very dead set this year on getting one. And what I wanted to do kind of once I come ac came across your page was to take a bear tooth and possibly make something out of that. Do you ever, outside of elk ivories, I know you've talked about that, but do you ever have anyone come to you with those kinds of requests? I've had people recently start requesting that. Um, I've not done any of that type of, of jewelry historically. That being said, I love learning. Like I'm a perpetual student forever and ever, <laughs> which is why I loved vet med, number one, because you can never know anything. But that's also why I love art. It's because it is impossible to yeah. know everything, right? So um, I enjoy getting into experiment. So I'm just usually straight up with clients like, never done that before. Uh, I know that I could do it. And this is what I'm thinking. And are you cool with me experimenting? And nine times out of 10, they're like, heck yeah. And if they're kind of nervous, I'm like, oh, here's another artist that I know, <laughs> you know, has set bear claws before or whatever. And I'll, we'll send them their way. But um, no, I love experimenting. And that would be super fun. Um, my sister wants me to set baby teeth from her daughter. Like I've gotten like all kinds of interesting requests. That's like a Victorian thing to have baby teeth set into jewelry. That's yeah. like a really antique thing to do. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm into the weird requests, man. Like bring them on. <laughs> I would like, I've also seen rings that are made out of like deer antlers and stuff like that. Have you ever had anyone request that? Or have you even yeah. thought about doing that? Like, I feel like that would be challenging too. I know a couple of artists that do it. So like actually before I started making jewelry, Aaron and I got married before I started officially diving into having my own business and stuff. I actually got him an, an antler ring as like his wedding band when we first got married. So like I found an artist on Etsy and had this guy, you know, he let me go through and pick like the color of the antler and stuff. And there's another great guy um, that I met through the bow rack, which is the only place that I have a display at. And they're amazing. And that's how I got set up with archery is because of Lisa um, Lisa and Wayne Endicott, but, um, they have a, a gentleman that they were featuring there after they, after my jewelry was on display there. Um, there's a guy called rogue antler works is what the name of his business is. And he specializes in the antler inlay jewelry. So I don't really know. Antler inlay is probably not something I'm going to get into. And he's so good at what he does. Like I would probably just field, field it out to like him. I would give people his information for him to go that direction. But um, I mean, I, I've seen people um, set like antler tips into necklaces and stuff called like a talisman or whatever. So I've seen cool stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I would be willing to do something like that. But then again, it always makes me sad when people are like chopping up antlers, unless you're making the rest of it into a mm -hmm. toy for your dog, I guess. But um, yeah. yeah, like we went to a friend's house um, to get our puppy that we have now. We drove over to Utah since his mm -hmm. dog, yeah. Ben, 
And um, he was showing Aaron like some of his sheds. I got to hold a moose paddle and stuff at his place. It was super fun. But he showed Aaron a, a shed that he had bought off a guy that it was giant. It was a mule deer shed and it was absolutely huge. And this guy that had it had no idea what he had. He had already cut off one of the tines trying to make an art project out of it. And I guess then oh, no. like, I, can I buy like the rest of that antler off of you? Cause he's just like a huge atypical yeah. monster. And the dude had already cut yeah. one of the tines off for an art project. And so you're just like, <laughs> So there's like oh, these no. that are like really hard to stomach, you know. You know, people are just like ruining maybe really, really, really cool antlers. I'm like, can't you do that out of like a little two point or a spike? Or <laughs> yeah, no, I have these. Um, I went mule deer hunting for the first time in Arizona earlier in the year, and I'm laughing as you say that. Like, I have a couple of sheds here. This is like a little tiny like dink coo shed that I, I got, it. but I have a really nice mule deer shed that I like. I look at it every day and I'm like, man, I want to do something with that, but I also don't want to ruin it. Like it's a, hold on. I don't want to knock anything off. It's just a three by three, but like, it's one of the first sheds I ever found. So I'm like, I'm pretty impressed by, and the fun part is that like, I was on the same deer. Yeah, no, I think like, it's funny that you say that. Cause I, yeah, I have found, after finding my first couple ones, I've thought similarly, like, man, I really want to do something with it, but I also don't want to ruin it. Yeah. um so yeah maybe a little like small one that i have is worth doing something with but also it's still no matter the size of it it's still cool and still for me like that that actually that small one i showed you was my very first one i've ever found so like whether it's small or not it has more meaning to it because it's the first one that i ever found uh but yeah i've seen like the the antler inlay stuff and i think that's cool that you kind of recognize whether it's either you recognize that there's someone out there who like really does it well. So you're willing to kind of recommend them. Um, or like you said, that you have a specific interest that you like to do. And that's one thing that I appreciate about a lot of artists is, you know, Hey, that's cool. I would very much love to create that for you, but that's not really within like my style. So I'm kind of going outside of my style. If I do that, can I create something within my style? And if I can't, let me refer out. Yeah. Um, Sometimes they get bummed because sometimes they wanted, like, it's, it's you that they wanted something from. And so when it comes to family and friends, sometimes I end up caving to that anyway. And I'll end up making them something because they just really want me to make it. And then I maybe don't show it on social media because I don't want to get more orders. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, that's that's funny. You're like, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. I know you've mentioned you use a lot of social media to kind of highlight what you're doing and put your business out there. But I know recently, like you were at the sheep show and then you mentioned you had some on display at the bow rack. Um, what does that also look like for your business? Do you, I know you also, you mentioned you do a lot of just custom orders, which I think is really cool. Um, but are, do you ever have anything that's like in stock that if people are interested and they want to kind of get something right away, they don't want to wait for it. Um, do you have that? And if somebody does a custom order, what is the, this is like a long question. <laughs> what is the timeline if someone like has a request for that as well? Oh, sure. So, um, I mostly do custom work, like probably like 90 to 95% of my workload is custom work. So that being said, my queue is long. Um, it will wax and wane depending on the season or the year or whatever. Um, but I'm like booked out for Christmas usually by like end of August or beginning of September, um, usually August. Um, and so that's a shorter turnaround, but sometimes, um, you know, I might be up to six months on weights because I have so many orders, but I also balance, um, being a, a mom at home. We have a homestead and stuff. So it's like some weeks I may only get 20 hours at my jeweler's bench. And then some weeks I might have, you know, a bunch of orders that really need to get done that have hard deadlines. And I just did like an 80 hour week. I did a ton of 80 hour weeks in December because I had so many Christmas orders. They just have to be done. And um, you know, life gets put on hold when you have like sick kids and, and whatever. And that's why I'm so grateful to be my own boss because I get to call my own shots and decide when we're taking vacations and I don't have to call on the yeah. work if my little guy's sick or something. But yeah, so there's, I mean, there's a pretty big range right there. Like right now I'm like booking like uh, middle to end of May, uh, probably end of May for custom work as of right now. Um, but it's all kind of a little bit fluid. So I give people usually general time frames on that. Um, as far as ready to ship inventory, 
I try to carve out time for that to do like a substantial shop update, which means, you know, it's going to be more, maybe like 10 items or more at least twice a year. Mm -hmm. I try to do that. Um, and then from an artistic perspective, I kind of just need it to be able to just make stuff that doesn't already have like a, a directions attached to it, if that makes sense. I really love custom work yeah. and that's why I do it. If I didn't like custom work, I would have you know, stop doing customs forever ago. I really like working with people and we kind of feed off each other for cool ideas and to make sure it fits their style and it's usable and, you know, all of those things and it's nice and comfortable and functional for them. So I really enjoy that like back and forth and getting to know my clients and a lot of them become friends just because of the process because we're in touch, you know. But um, yeah, so I mostly do custom work. We usually plan through like Instagram and stuff actually because it's so easy to send videos and pictures <laughs> back and forth um, and yeah. voice messages and whatnot. And then um, right now I only have one display total, and that is at the Bow Rack in Springfield, Oregon. And that's been there for, we're, we'll be getting close to like a year and a half that I've had a display there. Um, Lisa and I bonded like four or five years ago on a trip down there because Aaron had just gotten his bow and he was getting into archery and he had heard about the Bow Rack years ago. And so we drove down there for our anniversary. <laughs> That's what he said he wanted to do. I'm like, whatever. Yeah, so you know, I the I'll go sit in an archery shop. I wasn't doing archery yet. I always been intrigued by it, but I didn't know anything about it. And so um, we went and yeah. of course their shop was really, really busy. We were sitting there probably for like four or five hours waiting for Aaron's strings to get swapped out. But we were out of town. Oh, wow. or so it's not like a normal thing where you could just like leave the bow and then come back in like three days, right? So they were willing to, mm -hmm. to get us squished in. But um, Lisa and I ended up chatting yeah. a little bit and um, we just hit it off right away. She looks like a, like a mountain mermaid. She's got like really long blonde wavy yeah. hair and she's covered in turquoise and bangles and bracelets, but she's also like a hunter and a surfer. And I'm like, who is this chick? Like, she's so cool. And so we ended up really yeah. hitting it off and becoming friends. And I did custom work for her. Like she had me do a huge um, turquoise matching set for all of the women in their family, which is so cool. Um, and I actually just made yeah. one more thing to add to their, their group too. Um, but yeah, Lisa was, was super down to have a, a display there and they like that I do regional stones and I'm adding on Oregon stones this year along with Idaho and Utah. And so that has her excited too. They like to have, you know, stuff in there with personality. And a lot of times, I mean, as we know, like plenty women, more women are getting into archery, getting into, um, you know, marksmanship, getting into hunting. But the majority is still men at this point. And so I'm sure there are pretty, plenty of wives and girlfriends that are probably going in the bow shop and are like bored, waiting for whoever to get their stuff done. And so Lisa's like, excellent. Now they can be like, oh, you're getting a new bow. I really like this huge turquoise ring that was made down in Oregon. So that's kind of how that's we can make a trade here. <laughs> yeah. You get a treat, I get a treat. So, um, no, it's been really great though. And um, it's kind of blown my mind because. They've had that uh, Cam Haynes podcast, like part of his model for that is they have to come into the bow rack to shoot, which mm -hmm. now I think they're going out to Endicott Farms to do that. But that was like kind of had me tripping okay. for a minute. So it was like, like Tulsi Gabbard, Joe Rogan, like all these people that were like, like walk, would have walked past my display. I was like, they probably didn't look at it because they're there for archery. But to know that like it was like soaked up the, the presence of people like walking by, like it's such a trip for me. Um, that was such a weird, weird thing that happened. I'm like, wow, that's like so cool. And their shop is just doing so good. It makes me so happy. They're expanding it. They're adding more onto it. They're doing a bigger indoor shooting range. And like, they're just doing amazing. So I'm just happy to be part of it. Um, and so glad to have my stuff in there. I'm really picky about where I have displays. Um, I have to really, 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 truly like the business owners and their moral compass. And Bo Rock gives back to people all the time. Um, Wayne does, he won't, he won't tout about it, but he does a lot of work with homeless people around, um, Springfield and Eugene, and he doesn't advertise that, but he does like, they're such good people and they're always giving back to the veterans. They'll donate a bow, you know, to a veteran that wants to go on their first hunt. That's for like hunts that's for the brave or like whatever, like they're just, they're so giving that like that kind of stuff is like, okay, like I would have a display there, even though it's an archery shop and I make jewelry and I understand there's like not a lot of overlap there. But like that, that's why I want to support it. So we make archery themed jewelry to go in there with like arrows and stuff on it. But um, yeah, oh, it's cool. cool. Yeah. And then nonprofits. Um, I used to own an art gallery up in Washington State that we supported uh, nonprofits. We did match donations from each sale 
to go to different nonprofits and let the artists go through and pick kind of who they wanted to donate to. So that stuff's really important to me. Um, giving back is a big part of my business model too. Um, there's some things I give back to that I'm, I'm quiet about because they're not meant for anybody else besides me and the other person that's the recipient. But then there's other things that the intention is that they're a fundraiser. And so those are the times that it's awkward for me and I don't like showing off, you know, things that like I'm, I'm donating or giving for free because it, it feels really weird about like, mm -hmm. Um, I was just listening to your your other podcast that you did with Ricky Ricky Hunter. What's the gal's name? I'm mm -hmm. to think. Mm -hmm. um, but you're talking about like it's awkward to do like the whole like look at me and like look what I'm doing like kind yeah. of thing. So I really have to like force I hate myself. It. Yeah, I hate it too. But I have to force myself because of how my business works anyway to show people where I'm working on. Because if you don't show what you're doing, it's not going to help your business. But then it feels awkward too when you're doing something that's good and to like be showing mm -hmm. it off it feels weird but when it's based on auction or raffle like you have to otherwise mm -hmm. that nonprofit you're trying to help out is like not going to get what they should have gotten out of what you gifted them so yeah. um this is a good segue for me to mention on that subject um i'm in the middle of creating two pieces one for disabled outdoorsmen utah and then another mm -hmm. piece for uh hunts for the brave and I will be bringing those with me in person to the Hunt Expo at Salt Lake. Um, today's the oh, first cool. day of February, so later this month. And they will be um, raffling or auctioning those off as fundraisers for for their nonprofits. Oh. Those are both two really, really, really good nonprofits um, that do amazing work. Um, so I'm happy to support them. But yeah, so be on the lookout. I will be posting about those if you're going to be at the Salt Lake Expo. Hopefully you can go buy raffle tickets. I'm not sure if they'll be set up for accepting like online raffle tickets or not, but hopefully they do. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And I love that you, yeah, you, you mentioned you, part of your business model is giving back. Um, and I think that's huge. And then, yeah, you mentioned the, it's just so awkward to, and this is probably also the introvert in us. <laughs> it's awkward to just put yourself out there. Like I, I want to do good. I want to do things that I enjoy and part of, whether this podcast turns into a bigger business right right now it's a passion project um but like whether it turns into something bigger like that's just dependent on the effort i put into it the time i put into it but i know in order for it to grow like with the wild aspect of it and the strength aspect of it like i've got to put that kind of stuff out there too so i like sometimes i'll have pictures and i'm like god i don't what? like that was for me and that was a moment for me that I really like and that like I really enjoyed it and I'm a very like personal person I don't love putting my whole life out there especially like personal things um but that is like kind of what sells at the end of the day like people when, when people feel like they can relate to you um and they feel like maybe you've gone through something that they can relate to or they feel like you're just more genuine of a person versus just posting all the pretty pictures or all the cool pictures like that's really what sells and so you kind of have to find that and that kind of sounds like a bad way to put it but it's the best way to put it like you have to find that fine line between i'm Hum humbleness, I guess, right? Like I'm showing here's what I do. Here's what I like to do. Uh, but I also don't want to overshow and overshowing looks different for different people. Um, so then determining, engaging like, oh, what is too much and what's not enough. And that's what I hate about social media. <laughs> like it's just, I, I want to be personal, but I also want to share things but I want to meet people. So I can't keep too much to myself. And, and in today's day and age, like it's just a way to meet people. I think maybe even COVID probably highlighted that, like people realized how like socially isolated they truly were. And the only people they talked to on a day-to-day -day basis were the people that they worked with, if they worked. Yeah. Um, and then you lose your job and you go home and you're not socializing anymore. And so I do think there's, I, I always hate when I bring up COVID, but there's so many blessings in disguise that came out of that time period for so many people. And I think truly that's one of them it is a, so many people have now moved to social media for their businesses to put themselves out there, but how and which are you doing that? Are you doing it in a way that is humble and like shows who you are as a person? Or are you doing it in a way that's like strictly, strictly for the followers and the money? And that's, that's a hard gamble sometimes. <laughs> It, it is. I try not to overthink it too much um, because I am, I'm kind of like an empath anyway. So I really, um, mm -hmm. 
when other people are going through stuff, it, man, I feel it, even if they're complete strangers. And that's why, like, one of the <laughs> ways of, like, giving back is, like, sometimes I find complete strangers that on Instagram that are really going through it. Like, they just had something absolutely horribly tragic happen or whatever. And so um, mm -hmm. I won't go into details, but, like, that's, that's, like, one of my outreach things is because maybe they have a GoFundMe, but money only takes you so far. Doesn't bring back mm -hmm. a person that you lost or whatever situation is going on. And sometimes people just need something to hold, I think. Um, you know, to yeah. get through. And so um, it's hard for me. Like I have to draw a line sometimes bet between like what, especially in this day and age with everything going on in the world, the chaos that is unrolling mm -hmm. every single freaking day. Like I have to unplug from it sometimes because I do feel it so, yeah. so much. But, um, and I try, I am an extremely positive person. Luckily, I've never had anyone like accuse mm -hmm. me of being toxically positive. That's like a thing, which I actually <laughs> like roll my eyes a little bit when I was, I was like, yes, an overly positive person, like super offensive. But at the same oh, time, so, like, toxic. <laughs> so toxically happy. It's disgusting. But um, it's mm -hmm. it's also I, I mean, there's more and more research all the time. And this these are things that we know that we've, you know, if you're someone that has had that awakening to realize that our thoughts and our words really do mean a lot and that they do really project for what's going to come down the pipeline mm -hmm. right to you i firmly believe that and so yeah maybe i am toxically positive so that's why like i'm having rough days like i don't post it i don't have rough days very often i'm very blessed to say that but that's because mentally yeah. i tough my way through it i just do and um everyone has their own struggle i like you know everyone has their, their history of how they were raised and stuff and I did not grow up in an easy situation whatsoever. And I attribute part of that mm -hmm. to my mental toughness about why I can be so positive is because I've seen some stuff already. And so I feel like a lot of stuff, like as an adult, I'm like, all right, that's really crappy. Did that happen? All right, feel it for a minute. All right, what's the game plan to like move on from there and um, mm -hmm. you know start recovering or whatever from it. And I'm blessed to say that I've never experienced like a really, um, traumatic significant loss of anyone super super close to me that wasn't like um you know super old age like someone was really close to that passed away and they're like 90. it's like you have to like miss them a lot but at the same time you're like yeah cried for them upset for them they're like okay they live like an amazing life they almost made it to 100 it's good but like oh, I'm I'm coming. <laughs> and i'm blessed to say you know knock on wood like i've never experienced any of this other tragedy so i'm talking about the more the, the mountains on a molehill mentality is what I'm talking about. Not like the actual sincere, mm -hmm. like traumatic, horrible events that people go through. I'm not telling most people to like suck it up and move on. But like the little stuff where like, I don't know, you just have things that happen and, and you can power through it. And that's just kind of, that's how I've always, that's how I've always been. That's how I've had to be. And maybe that's like a lifetime of um, like survival <laughs> instinct or I'm not sure, but I figured out. And like, that's just, that's just how I look at my business too is that every business is going to have, you know, the dips and, and the, the mountains and everything and have the good months for revenue and the bad months for revenue. And that's just part of opening a business. It's just part of life. And so um, as far as like being worried about what to share, um, yeah, I'm very private about like small struggles like that, but it's also because like I'm an empath. And so when I feel other people's positivity through them talking mm -hmm. through stuff, like there's certain accounts I follow because they're always positive. So that being said, I think the real message is like, just literally be yourself and don't like overly dissect or analyze it. And the people that appreciate you will follow you. And the ones that don't hopefully won't, or they'll keyboard worry themselves into getting blocked or whatever ends up happening. But it's like, you know, it's like, uh, luckily I haven't had to use that function too much. It's mostly like creepy people. Yeah. Like, Can I see pictures of your yeah. feet or oh. something? I'm like, <laughs> I've had my fair share of creeps. That's so funny. No, I love that you say that too, because I I relate in that I am also an empath and there can be someone who just like posted something on social media that I've never met and I'm like, oh, I hurt for them. And I, and I joke and my, I haven't always been this way, but like as I get older, like I've become an emotional bitch is what I say, <laughs> because like I just grow more and more into that, like being an empathetic person and, you know, I... I cry, but I cry at like all emotions, right? Like when I'm really freaking happy and I feel like really incredibly happy, I cry. When I feel really incredibly sad, whether that's for me, for something that I'm going through or for, for someone else, like if someone's telling me a story and I'm like, oh, like 
I hate to hear that. And I'll start crying and they're like, you don't have to cry. <laughs> I'm like, no, I just, I feel like what you're going through and I hate that for you. And I wish that you weren't going through that. And, and kind of like you said, I've just, I've, I've similar, I've been through so many things where I'm resilient um, and I don't let those things bring me back. But like in that moment, I feel that so deeply and I'm going to feel that. I think that is, I, and imagine you can relate part of what makes us like decent human beings <laughs> is that we can be present in a moment and feel what is supposed to be felt there versus I feel like most people don't want to feel those things and they want to run from it and that can be tough but I feel like this is you were coming up on the end here and like kind of how we ended that conversation is a really good segue into how I always end these episodes is by asking my guess, what does wild strength mean to you? And so you kind of mentioned maybe just some things that you've been through. Uh, so you can either take that quite literally about just training and stuff like that and strength related, or you can kind of take more of like a mental health approach or something related to hunting or work, however you want to take that. But I feel like, yeah, the conversation we ended with is a really perfect segue into that question. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I feel like it's a blend of all of those. So like, that's another thing about me is that um most things don't have like definite like margins you know i feel like there's always like a gradient of everything and so um sometimes you know it's like it's it's a blend of like physical health with mental health together how they impact each other mm -hmm. so much and this is like literally what you probably have studied right because i know that you're also a science nerd on that backside. but um mm -hmm. i think that you know that word resilience is everything is that no one is mm -hmm. ever going to make it out of life unscathed. You just aren't. Mm -hmm. And when you have, have been maybe overly protected as a kid, when you get to be an adult and they're not there to protect you from that bad stuff anymore, like I think it really, really hits those adults extra hard. Um, and the kids that got raised in some crap tend to be really resilient from a young age and not a lot phases them as adults, right? But the fact is, is that no one makes it out of life unscathed. So I think it's really um, to, to have wild strength, I think is to be resilient and to be okay with challenges, but to always continue to push yourself to be better no matter what you're in. Whether it's in your craft, mm -hmm. like art, whether it's in your weightlifting, it's in your hunting, it's in, you know, whatever goals you're working towards for yourself or, um, you know, making a difference with like a nonprofit or an outreach, you know, it's like you making this podcast trying to inspire other people is that there's always room for improvement. You are never at the top. And to remember that those at the top mm -hmm. can quickly get knocked down and to keep your head about you right and to surround yourself with really good people that are like-minded but also encouraging um and just really go get her so yeah wild strength we'll say resilience wanting to push yourself being okay with challenges and and uh life right and then making sure that you have a good support network i think that that is those are my four for having wild strength i think that's those are my my four pillars yeah, for it as we're having this conversation, I'm like, why have we never talked it? Like, why have we never talked in depth before? Like we, we've chatted on like Instagram and stuff like that a little bit, but I'm like, God, we're so similar. Um, oh, this has been great. And I definitely probably have a million more questions for you. Um, but where can people find you if they want to get jewelry from you, if they just want to chat with you, cause you're an awesome person. If they just want to see what you're up to, where can people find you? <laughs> um, well, so GhostTimeMetalWorks.com is my website. Um, I'm trying to do both booth of shows this year, which historically I've not been much of a booth show person, reference back to that introvert thing. And also mostly mm -hmm. being custom work. So like, I just bring like other people's custom yeah. things that I repoed for the weekend that they let me show off. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm trying to do more booth events, but yeah, GhostTimeMetalWorks.com. You can get on my email list there. I'll send out, you know, messages and stuff. The best place to know what's going on is gonna be Instagram. Um, Ghost Town Metalworks is my main OG Instagram account. It's a little bit shadow banny there at the moment, but also it's mostly just strictly jewelry <laughs> and it is a proper business account. So uh, if you look in the bio there, it'll tell you Ghost Town Fine Jewelry. Like I have another handle there. That's like my mixing pot account that really is like the true charity account where you get like everything. Um, you know, I don't show everything from my life there, but sometimes you get a pretty good good read depending on the day but like i'll show myself making jewelry or whatever random thing is on my mind that like we tap on the stories you never know what you're gonna get but that being said i'm super reachable there instagram's not hiding my dms on that account yet so like <laughs> you can find me there so oh, ghost town finds you 
<laughs> yeah, Ghost Town Fine Jewelry is probably the best one, uh, you know, specifically for like your niche of, of the types of followers you have here that are tuning in. That would be the better mm-hmm. account. More outdoorsy, home study, um, and just, yeah, everyday life mixed in with, with jewelry and usually plenty of nerdy facets to it in all kinds of regards. <laughs> So, and self-improvement, I post a lot of self-improvement stuff there too, because that is something that's so big to me. Um, and so, yeah, I just try to keep it generally upbeat and usually pretty entertaining and funny. And then every once in a while, there'll be pretty serious things in there that I feel like people need to be paying attention to. And then you get to see jewelry made. So it's everything.